All right, so here's what we got so far in the Olympian Pantheon. Aquarius is empty. <laughs> Part two, the Titans. I think officially there are 12 Titans, at least the main Titans, the main children of Gaia. But I have 14 here that we'll go through. Number one, Gaia or Terra. Like I said, the Titans are children of Gaia. Terra is the Roman name. She's the Earth Mother Goddess of Greek mythology. Probably a fixed sign, right? something that's more solid and consistent. Gaia, Taurus, makes perfect sense. The Titans are a generation of gods and goddesses that really were a more original pantheon than the Olympians. Because of this, all the Titans get a bad rap. You know, history is written by the victors. In this case, the victors were whichever Indo-European cultures came in, probably related to Thracians, maybe the Dorians, so these deities represent themes and ideas that are closer to the Neolithic, closer to the original revolution of civilization in the Mediterranean, at least for the Greeks. Now, specifically, the Pelasgians might be a term that you might want to look up related to these people. They probably originally came from Cyprus and were seafarers who migrated throughout the Mediterranean. You know, a lot of these deities are going to be, you know, maybe going back quite far and uh, probably going back way further in the case of Gaia um, since Gaia or Earth Mother is basically a motif that you see around almost every culture on Earth. The counterpart to Gaia. Now the Romans call him Uranus which I think is really more of just a translation of Uranus and therefore might have come later maybe from some uh, Ionian Greek settler influence in Italy but the original word for the Romans was Kalos, actually, their sky god, which had basically the same um, meaning. At last, we can finally fill in something that's been a void here, Aquarius. Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto were all named after the invention of the telescope. They were not named by the ancient Greeks and Romans. I think Pluto in particular was actually a referendum or something where people suggested names, and a little girl suggested Pluto. Neptune and Uranus were also named by modern astronomers and astrologers. It's actually interesting and lucky that they managed to get the archetypes right. It's interesting that despite being modern interpretations, Neptune, Uranus, and Pluto just so happened to fill in the three gaps that astrology really needed to fill to associate with those particular motifs. Aquarius, Neptune, and Pluto all had dual ownership of certain planets. Pisces, for instance, I think co-owned Jupiter. When they finally gave Neptune, the god of the ocean, their own planet, it makes perfect sense for that to be Pisces. So Kronos, the final piece uh, of the puzzle of the planets. Uh, Kronos is associated with time, the original harvest and civilizational deity. Hesiod, which is an ancient Greek poet, would have called it the, the Golden Age. Saturn is very much linked to Capricorn. This is the final of the deities that has a pure association with the planets. So now I think we have a full set. If I can look at it, we have Mars, Earth, Mercury, the Moon, the Sun, Ceres, or the asteroid belt, Venus, Pluto, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. That's the 12 Celestials. Capricorn is defined by what Kronos is. He gets a very bad rap in his stories written by the Olympian generation. But ultimately, the Christians partially get their name for Satan from Saturn and from Satyr, which is you know, another term for a half-goat, half-man. Which is also, again, why Pan is related to this whole motif as well. There may have been more of a relationship between what Kronos represents as a civilizer and what Pan represents as kind of a wild man. I like this imagery. There's a certain power and 
dignity about him. So this vibe is very similar to Osiris with the Egyptians and Shiva with the Hindus, the heroic, triumphant king or ruler who provides for his people and leads them to a golden age, which is where his partner then comes in. Now again, because the myths can be so um, negatively painting of Kronos, they are likewise <laughs> quite empty on Rhea and like her background. Like her children, the Olympian gods, are being consumed by Kronos as they are birthed. She basically hides Zeus and has someone rear him to overthrow and save her. It's a very, you know, disturbing story. It, it makes sense for getting to the motif of corrupt power that tries to devour and doesn't wish to be usurped. But the whole fear of usurpation motif from the Greek myth, it's, it's quite tired. <laughs> Honestly, it's, it's in almost every story. There's some per, some king who is corrupt and is trying to take power, some tyrant who wants to keep his power and has to kick out the young and does not step aside and rear a proper successor. And in part, that's why he represents time and inevitability of death. Rhea, I think, has more depth when you find other deities that are like her, like Abundatia, and from Opus, the Roman Rhea. As the image shows there, this is, I think, a portrayal specifically of Opus. There's not much art out there for this, so if you're an artist, we need more. <laughs> we need more art. You would think that there would be plenty of art for these important deities, but there's really not, there's almost never enough by any means, um, AI or artistic prowess. We need more art for this, and Opus would be a great one to start. Here's why. She's a goddess of abundance and the land and providence. Rhea has a specific relationship to Demeter. Both of them evolved from probably the main queen of the pantheon of the Neolithic first farmers of the Mediterranean, the first farmers of Europe. A deity that's similar to her is Cabele, who is actually alone from the Phrygians, which I mentioned earlier with Dionysus, is an Orphic-related deity, but also the deity Dea Sura, which is like a Roman name for her. It basically means the goddess of Syria. Like with um, the goddess Ceres, the name Ceres and Syria, the very country Syria today, stems from the name for cereals, which is where cereals were first cultivated. There's a lot of new research coming in about uh, like the Gobekli Tepe people. Um, that was a particular settlement. It was part of an entire movement of the Neolithic Revolution. It's like we have so many sources of food now. There was so, so much abundance that came out of these new innovations. Population exploded. And at least in the first few centuries or millennia, it was basically paradise. It was basically a golden age. And it evolved eventually into a silver age, then into a bronze age, then into an iron age. And the Hesiod system of the ages is a system that goes from high hopes and goodness down to war and chaos and strife. When it comes to being wholesome, <laughs> and when it comes to having values that are pretty relevant today, especially in the world we live in with climate change and other threats, and where we really need to find a way to come together again and, and go back to our roots and the land, and I find it very inspiring, but I put her within Virgo. It was said that Rhea was reincarnated in some way into Demeter. Like we see in the story, when Rhea hides Zeus, Rhea doesn't really come back. Why would this powerful deity, why would she suddenly have no influence and just be completely gone from the pantheon? And she should have even bestowed the kingship upon uh, Zeus, if anything. One way or another, Rhea evolves or is demoted or otherwise transitions into Demeter. Let's go to the next one, huh? Of course, whenever we have a goddess of the moon, we're going to be putting it in Cancer. It's not every single time, but in this particular case, I have two deities here. Of course, there's Selene, whose counterpart in Rome is Luna, and is the very name of the moon that we call today. But Phoebe is the other goddess. 
and Phoebe and Celine are not the same. Phoebe, I believe, is actually a mother or grandmother of Celine. Phoebe is a goddess more of light and reflection, abstraction uh, of, of the moon. But for the sake of simplicity here, I'm going to conflate them. I honestly get a lot of kind of token vibes from this. Um, JRR token, that is. Let me get you a little fourth wall break right here. Luna. All the way down. Este, I believe. Just the vibe of how token kind of shows the elves in their astral sort of way. There's a lot of deities that have this kind of pure lunar cancer vibe. Artemis, for instance, the younger generation, Olympian generation of the moon goddess, is a lot more grounded in animals and nature and wilderness. Selene and Luna and Phoebe are very astral. They're very up there, out there. Cancer is <laughs> of no no question. Whenever we have a moon, we have the sun as a counterpart. Helios. In Rome, they call Sol or Soranus, Sol Invictus, basically the high deity of late Rome. During the transition from basically Augustus to Christianity, what we know now to be Lucifer. Leo. And where we have light, we also have dark. Nix or Nox is a very ancient titaness. I'm stretching the word titan to include her because she is cosmic. Nyx may be the very oldest goddess. Be the night, the darkness, the void, the abyss. I've done another conflation as well here with Styx and with Tethys. The grounds from which I am conflating them is not purely academic. It's more aesthetic. Styx is the very waterway of Hades, where the souls drift in and through in the underworld. It's sometimes personified by a female deity. One that I think is actually quite similar to Tethys, who is also a Greek goddess of the Nexus river system, where all the rivers come together and meet up. I associate them with Scorpio. You see, Scorpio is a water sign, and it's also considered a chthonic sign. I mean, look at Hades. He is a god of the underworld. To see the eternal abyss, to see that metaphorically reflected in the dark reservoirs of the underworld, there's a life-giving force here that I think is very interesting to add to the, the idea of darkness. So Tethys's partner is Oceanus, the ocean uh, in Pisces, right? Is it arbitrary to say Pisces is always the ocean? Like in the case of Aphrodite, she was born in the ocean because one of her parents was an oceanic goddess. There's, there's many deities that can be born of the ocean, but are not of the ocean thematically. Let's look at it this way. Before people knew Ceres existed, or Pluto, or Neptune, or Uranus, there were still four archetypes, and I could add a fifth for the Earth itself. Many of these five were considered basically parts of the Earth itself. Uh, Taurus, another one associated with the Earth, would be Virgo, the land, and that has more to do with the life of the Earth, the biosphere, you might say. And then the other three aspects of the world, sky, and the sea, and the underworld. Those are all, for lack of a better term, almost sounding Norse, the realms of the worlds. Like, it doesn't matter how many planets we'd have, or if we had more or less than we do, people would find at least a dozen things to latch on to and to represent. Neptune came to represent what the ocean and the sea represented. So next we get to Themis, and another conflation I made is with Metis, who is also a goddess of order and goodness, essentially. And Metis is actually the advisor of Zeus during the Titanomachy, during his fight with the Titans, with Kronos, over rulership. Being one of the Titans is something of a traitor, but also, I believe she was devoured by Zeus himself. A strange kind of flip of the metaphor of what Kronos did. There is something corrupt and tyrannical about what Zeus did and how he took over and how suddenly when he appears all of these people are said to be children of Zeus. Matisse is a deity who seems to have been punished 
regardless of her helping of him and her selection, you know, of him to be king. Through usurping that, his mind later gives birth to Athena, a stripped down version of Themis. That no longer is she elder and looking down upon Zeus and the Olympians with judgment. Instead, she becomes a child of Zeus and simply born of his mind. Overall, Themis, and by extension, Metis, and by extension also, Dike and Justitia, just have a common relationship back to, you remember, Ishtar and Inanna, the original priestesses of rulership and civilization. I forgot to put Oceanus up here, I'm so sorry. She is the goddess of Libra. The literal Libra is running around the scales that she's holding. Um, Themis is actually considered to be an Olympian, and considered to be the first wife of Zeus. It's another reason I conflate her with Matisse, because Matisse, as an advisor, essentially became uh, the first wife of Zeus, same as the Ishtar priests were to the kings of, of Sumer and Babylon. So Atlas was pretty complicated for me. I was first going in the direction of Atlas being associated with Capricorn in some way. Um, maybe with Sisyphus, which I think is an apt metaphor for Capricorn. Um, always working very practical as a power sign, as a cardinal sign. Very driven in an earthy way. And like in this um, fun, almost Conan-looking depiction, he's shown holding up the earth and that's often what we think of now and he's associated with uh, i mean i'm a geographer so i like thinking of atlas as a god of geography of mapping and of the earth but he's actually technically described to be holding up the celestial sphere and that's i uh, one of two things either that's the sky itself or the heavens which would be all of the zodiac and the stars and the constellations but there's a god named astraeus and Astraeus was the counterpart, essentially, to Ishtar. The name actually related to Aftar, uh, Ishtaran, but essentially male Libra, I suppose, vibe. A judge, the astral judge, often associated with the evening star. So, like, usually Ishtar was Ishtar and the dawn goddess is often associated with the morning star. So that's Venus in the morning when it's coming up the horizon um, before the sun. Morning Star and Evening Star were considered aspects of the same deity, the same Venus. Astraeus was, it kind of evolved into a god of the stars. Um, and that's really interesting. But that's no longer really what Atlas meant, and certainly not in Greek mythology. Eventually, he evolved into this kind of earth making deity. I'm from Minnesota, and so I always say Paul Bunyan. It's pretty funny. But Paul Bunyan is like a version of this this motif, as crazy as it is. It's a modern myth that was actually made with the motif of Atlas, with the motif of Ymir in Norse, or of Pengu in Chinese, is this great earth shaper. And that whole earth vibe is very, very different from an astral stellar vibe. They don't jive very well. I don't have Astraeus in here, so... I'm going to go with the heavy earth vibe on what Atlas is. And Atlas, specifically in the myths, is a particular titan who rules Atlantis. Atlantis is essentially a paradise. It's a perfect place. He's In that way, he's kind of similar to Kronos again, in that positive aspect of Kronos thing, in that he led a golden age. He was the last or titan god to be defeated by the Olympian generation. The last golden age. The last remnant of the golden age before these presumably Iron Age, Indo-European people came in and kind of disrupted the, the harmony. I suggest the Berber cultures of North Africa might have actually been the original worshippers of this Atlas deity, whoever he was, and that the Greek and later Roman names for him, um, specifically referring to the Atlas Mountains in North Africa as him, were more of an exonym. And maybe they took Astraeus, which was from their mythology, and then kind of conflated them with this more mountainous deity from somewhere else. Or maybe it was another version of Kronos that had gone along the North African coast, whereas the other branch went along the northern edge of the Mediterranean into Greece and such. And maybe they just became somewhat different and distinct, but were both basically the civilizing mountain earth god. A lot of this energy is putting me in Capricorn. However, 
recently I had come to a few conclusions about some other deities like Pengu of these giants landscaping where I came to associate them more with the behemoth, basically a giant bull, which is more associated with Gaia. And so I've come to actually see him as the male Taurus. There's aspects of Capricorn. There's aspects of maybe Aquarius with the astral stuff going on. And right next to uh, him, because I was referring to uh, Astraeus, is Asteria, basically the feminine counterpart. Although it might have stemmed originally from something of Ishtar um, and Asherah, which was a Jewish or Canaanite and uh, Syrian name, is the astral goddess of the heavens. Libra is not so astral. Themis is very grounded on humans and human activity and good and evil and, you know, balance. Asteria is a goddess of the stars themselves and even of the constellations and of astrology itself. Asteria is technically, I think, again, either a daughter or granddaughter of Thea, similar to, you know, I had Phoebe and, and Luna. Thea is a goddess of essentially uh, diamonds and beauty and brilliance and light, again, kind of like Phoebe. But whereas Phoebe is a goddess of light itself, kind of ethereal, Thea is a goddess of direct kind of emanation, um, almost plasma, honestly. And that's kind of why I like this art here. Um, it's really beautiful art. So Urania is actually the Roman term. It's basically a female counterpart of Uranus. All of the aspects of Uranus in the feminine have to do with vision. She represents the cosmic beginnings, or a cosmic sort of benevolent force of creation. And it's a very interesting vibe. Uh, you don't see too many deities with this explicit vibe. There is um, Nut of Egypt, which, like, even the ancient art is really beautiful, like, depicted with the stars on their body and, like, very colorful and vibrant it's a very modern um almost postmodern, very uh neo uh sort of vibe which again this art seems to do quite well to get at it um, we are in the age of aquarius as they say yeah that would be it they have different ages you know they're both titans but um uranus if he's a god of the sky, and then he is a god of the earth sky. And he might represent all skies to some degree. I would say Aether is more apt to represent all skies, or at least gas, in the more cosmic sense. But when it comes to Asteria, I think the astral and the cosmic comes first. And so I think Asteria is older even than Uranus. Here's one somewhat close to my heart. Uh, and I did find art for him. So, like, this is an example of art that is explicitly about him. And it's very fascinating to me that all the research I found from him led me to put him in Gemini. Because I, I saw a video of another person doing basically what I'm doing, and they associated Athena with Gemini because Athena was a goddess of wisdom. That's maybe one connection. It's not enough. But what was interesting is this owl that this person drew. That little connection, to me, is fascinating. Because from whoever did this art, an owl, since Athena is associated with it, basically represents wisdom. He represents the, the eyes that see and, and report to her, in a sense. Uh, very similar to Eagle Zeus, or, or sorry, Zeus's eagle, or in Assassin's Creed, there's the archetype of the eagle or the hawk or whatever it is that follows around the main character, the assassin, and gives them a greater view of the world. Now, that archetype is very old and goes into many cultures, including Amerindian culture, including Greek culture. It's the idea of the... Um, the chosen one, I suppose, chosen by a, a deity that takes the form of a flying uh, animal of some kind to watch over 
and uh, benefit and give vantage. Now, I, I don't look at that as much as chosen one in the tropey sense because it's not just chosen by the writer, it's chosen by a character in the story. If we're talking about mythology, then the character of Zeus chooses Hercules, for instance. Right? He's there, he helps him out, he bails him out a lot of the time. Even if it can be a deus ex machina at times, it's more interesting because Zeus has flaws as a character. And because he's running up against other characters and other deities like Hera that have different aims and different goals. Hera hates Hercules and is constantly trying to undermine his efforts. But he keeps succeeding regardless. And we start to like Zeus, like Hercules as a character because it's kind of noble how he keeps sometimes fumbling, sometimes intelligently and cleverly overcoming every task that he's thrown at. It's a fun story. So all that goes <laughs> down a big rabbit hole, but coming out the other end of it, what if Coeus is the owl? What if he's Athena's owl? What if that person that said Athena associated with Gemini was not completely wrong because there was an aspect of her that was, it was the owl that was uh, whispering wisdom into her ear. This is actually similar to uh, Odin, who uses the head of Mimir that he holds around basically in his pocket. And Mimir is the head of the original uh, god of intelligence and life um, who was killed and martyred. His intelligence and his blood was sewn into the clay of humankind. That also shares all kinds of other motifs to um, other gods like Quetzalcoatl or Kukul Klan or the Averari of the ayahuasca traditions. These gods or god that represents life itself, that represents DNA, that represents information, that represents evolution. But there's aspects of coeus that even make my mind think of the, the coil of the DNA. Or on Hermes' staff, the caduceus, there are two serpents twining around it and the eagle wings at the top. I sometimes think of polis and coeus as either those two serpents or the pole between those two serpents. Now, the elder god of Gemini also represents the old wise wizard. There's a lot going on here. Put more art out there, like, and put your idea out there. I didn't find anything really in all of my research to correlate Coeus with an owl. Whatever connections they made artistically to link those two things is incredibly inspir inspiring to me. And it made my mind go down this entire rabbit hole um, and come out with some some gems. And we got to have data and we have to understand how the archaeology and, and the evolution of humanity works. But we have to also be artists and try to create something more adaptive and useful. Let's go to his brother. There's, again, not that much information on him. He's associated with the South Pole and he's associated with constellations to some degree. And it's never really that explicit what exactly he does in all of that. It's Coeus the North Pole, Creus the South Pole. And so the two are basically like twin serpents surrounding the uh, Axis Mundi, the Axis of the World, the, the World Tree. When we start to think more creatively, we start to um, kind of see cultures as the subjective artistic expressions they are, we recognize that not only Greeks, but um, just Mediterraneans in general, they didn't really reach the South Pole. At least we don't have any record of that. The furthest record we have of southward movement from Mediterranean people is Phoenician or Carthaginians under Hanno, um, who explored the Ivory Coast of Africa. Um, they literally took gorillas home to with them to Carthage. It is fascinating. But basically the farthest south they knew is the equator. If Polis is the Poles, then why can't Creus be the equator? Because those are really different things. Um, but they're still on the same scale of importance. The poles are extremely important in regulating the cool temperature of the Earth. The equator is actually very important too. It's the greatest reception of external, you know, heat. It's also where we get most of our, you know, moisture. It's heat that causes the evaporation of water. When I found this piece of art, it's interesting how they depicted it, like snapping the fire of those constellations into being fairly Aries, like a fairly Aries interpretation. 
with the armor and the red and the kind of youthfulness. It's got a very Ares flavor to it. Really, I could have easily had him been simply one of the two twins and considered Gemini. He'd just be the South Pole and Koyas would be the North Pole. But looking at the twins as maybe an Ares and a Gemini in this case, one represent the poles, one representing the equator, one representing uh, curiosity, which is like the expansive exploration of new ideas versus critique, two aspects of intelligence. These two deities, I've gotten a lot of my own influence in, I, I admit. If you have any other interpretations of them, feel free to put them down in the comments. Like, I'm really interested in it, what anyone else has. Or if you have any art that you'd like to make of them to portray them and whatever idea you have, so I'm going to take him and drag him where he's supposed to be. I didn't put Atlas on Taurus. Did I not put Helios? Oh, wow, look at that. I'm doing a cleanup job. This is this is what I get for trying to edit in real time. This is our last. Yes, that's Dionysus down there. He is still uh, forsaken. Uh, we don't have a place for him. Nemocene, Moneta in Roman. It's the goddess of memory. I almost didn't include it. I almost always forget to include it because uh, at least the Greek motif here is not ever very strong. This is another one where um, the imagery has an influence. This image right here reminds me a lot of the Fates, but also of Hecate, you know, a goddess of three bodies, uh, three personas one of which is holding, as you can see on the left here, she's holding a torch. I mean, she's holding a torch on the right too. Um, and there's no dog here, so it's not like everything is there, and they have angelic wings. When I did research on Nemesine, I had first considered her to have Virgo in aspects, because I think at that time I had conflated some of Fortuna with Virgo, because of the whole uh, you know, Rhea abundance sort of vibe. Um, later, I felt Fortuna deserved to be in a different category. But Nemocene kind of uh, represented something of a more abstract, uh, conceptual idea of fate. She's actually the goddess or the mother of the Muses. And that's a very interesting lens because the Muses, of course, are, the, are the, all the art forms. This may be one of the only deities that when I did this research for this particular presentation, I wasn't sure where to place them, other than Dionysus. Dionysus, I actually have a place for him in my cusp system. And with Nemesine, I had kind of a listing based on the cusps. Since she's related to the fates, I also relate her in some sense and her name to Morgan or Morgana, these fatalistic sort of death uh, prophecy deities. There are a few different, uh, the, you know, Moira. They're the, they're the fates, basically. I think that's the Roman word for the fates. When I did this research, I actually entertained with the muses that there is something scorpionic about it. And this could, this one's probably most up to change because I kind of did it on a whim. Because I, I think she could easily be conflated with Morgana and therefore go wherever Morgana goes into a cusp sign that I have not said. But if we look at or maybe add to Scorpio these mosaic muse aspects, then we get, you know, a tendency towards art and expression that is very Scorpionic, potentially. So there we have it. That's all of them. It only took, I don't know how many hours. Uh, this is very new to me, uh, and as usual, I go really deep with it. It's actually really interesting to lay it out this way. I'm always open to new new perspectives and new interpretations. I think part of what makes this really fun and crunchy for me and why I've been so passionate about it these past two years is because I just love making connections. And I love learning new things, and I also don't really believe that anything's original. All of these archetypes, all these themes, when you lay them out in some sort of consistent system, I feel like it helps. If you want some more of these um, with different mythologies, like maybe Egypt, uh, maybe the Norse, 
maybe Hindu, leave a comment, subscribe, maybe, like the video. <laughs> I already have a lot of research basically done for these correlations. Um, I got my corny uh, column, so I'm ready to go. This was Sapienite. Thanks for watching.